If you're in pain today, God sees you and he wants to help you. If you're tired out, let's say you're just weary of life, then God wants to help you. He wants to refresh you. He wants to restore you. So just close your eyes right now and receive his help as I pray. Precious Heavenly Father, I just ask that you help my dear brother, my dear sister, restore them, strengthen them, revive them, refresh them, all in the precious name of Jesus. Lord, so that we can hear your word. We need to hear your word today. We ask for the help, the helpful assignment of the Holy Spirit right there in our living room, in our life, in our hotel room, wherever we are. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. Life. This is part four. We're going to wrap up with this profound truth that it's your choice. Life is your choice. When I was in my early 20s, I remember a very discouraging time in turning to God for an answer. And I found myself opening the Bible to Proverbs 22, verse 4. Now, since then, it's become one of my favorite verses. But at the moment, it sounded like this. The reward of humility and the reverent and worshipful fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. And it it did not encourage me. No, it did the exact opposite. I found it discouraging. I began to have this conversation with Father God that went something like this. I heard a question in my heart. Do you have true riches, Stephen? Do you have honor? Do you have life? My answer was no. Ten times no. Then I heard in the most kind, gentle way, if you don't have these things, is it possible you aren't walking in humility? and really don't know how to effectively worship me? That's what I heard. It was simple, deductive reasoning. If two plus two equals four, and you're at a zero, or like I was, minus three, don't lie to yourself, or pull some crazy equity lever. You see, God wants you to get your authority back for life. If it's everybody else's fault and everything is to blame for not having life, then you have absolutely no control over your outcome. If the lack of true riches, honor, and life, as Proverbs 22, 4 said, is the system's fault or daddy's fault or society's fault, government's responsibility, the need for equity, too much carbon, not enough inclusion, tolerance, and too many sugary snacks, well, then, my friend, you will never, ever be in the driver's seat of your own life. Why? Because you've been tricked into deferring all responsibility and accountability. That's what it takes to fulfill your God-like design. Authority, the responsibility of choice. If you defer all power of choice, you lose the power of your identity, the binary choice of life or death, blessing or cursing. Own it or lose it. I spoke of ideology versus truth in part one. This is where ideology is so dangerous because it passes the buck. It blames the other guy. When the bar for life gets lowered, beware. They're stealing your identity, your authority, and your destiny. You got to own it, my friend. Don't defer responsibility if you want life. I warned a pastor friend of mine years ago that spiritual socialism would overtake his fellowship. He didn't understand that it was a switch of tolerance in exchange for truth, approval for authority. And now they have the blind leading the blind. Think of it. Prayers of approval and tolerance don't move mountains. No. Faith of authority based on truth get people healed, saved, and delivered. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says this, I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, the blessings and the curses. Therefore, God says, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, he speaks often of his grandpa, who is his hero. Their family went from cotton, this is Tim's words, their family went from cotton to Congress in one generation. Born in the 1920s, his grandpa told him this, you can be a victim or a victor, but you can't be both. We live in a world order that is demanding and insistent on there being multiple choice for life. We've all seen that car driving down the road, plastered with bumper stickers, and right there in the center is that coexist declaration. It reveals the confused state of its owner. Faith is like life. It's binary. You're either in or you're out. You're on or you're off, alive or dead, here or there. 
When secularism tries to replace God and truth with a better idea, they're desperate to eliminate the identities of life, truth, light, and love. They become terms subject to revision instead of God identities. It's all to persuade you to defer your power of choice for a new doctrine of tolerance, equity, subjective morality. Regardless of what this new politically correct religion is, the trade costs you all of your authority, your power for true life. You end up in the backseat chauffeured into oblivion. Do you want the Proverbs 22 for life? I know you do. Well, take responsibility and quit blaming everybody. Joseph of Genesis was sold into slavery by his brothers, falsely accused of rape by the Egyptian Me Too movement, and then he spent years in prison. He didn't blame anyone. He chose to believe on God, and guess what? God promoted him to the palace. You will never be able to steer for your life until you own it. Blame gets you nowhere. So what happened to me after that talk with God about being bankrupt of the blessings in Proverbs 22, verse 4? I owned it. I said, obviously, I'm kidding myself. I'm not walking in humility, and I'm not really worshiping God, even though, check this out, I was a a worship leader for churches and youth conferences. I owned it. The moment I did that, everything changed. Doors opened up. Clarity came to my mind. My small decisions started lining up with the big decision to take responsibility for choosing life. I suddenly had authority that worked. So you may not be a believer at this moment. Maybe you're a seeker. You're seeking. You're looking for the truth. You might have tried secularism, Marxism, or even witchcraft. Maybe naturalism. Naturalists get excited about the environment, a science that seems to give them a form of control. People like Bill Nye, the science guy, he believes that there's an anti-science epidemic contaminating our culture. He, along with his producers, have this anti-God, anti-religion, humanistic worldview. The absolutes of God's word, the Christian faith, are all a threat to their atheistic worldview. They have this astonishing belief in life that, that life is without intelligent design. It's all just random. It's chance. Kind of like enjoying the fruit of a tree, but denying the root of the tree, so to speak. I don't know anything about basketball. And even I can tell you that you need more than a ball. You've got to have a hoop. You've got to have some boundaries. Otherwise, there's no game. There's no points. There's no way to even um, calculate the points. There is a point to life, a true why for your existence. Without the wisdom, you become just another angry, lost soul, claiming life has no point because you refuse the basics of life, the answer to who, what, and why. I said in part two, we become who we are when we believe who God is, who the intelligent designer is. This is key to all of our lives, key to life. C.S. Lewis, famous author, famous, people don't realize he was an atheist before he became a believer. He said this, I was at this time living like so many atheists or anti-theists, In a world of contradictions, I maintained that God did not exist. I was also very angry with God for not existing. I was equally angry with him for creating a world. Talk about contradictions. But a dedicated naturalist, nihilist, or atheist might say, I just don't believe intelligence was involved with the reality of life. Now that takes an exceptional amount of wild, wild faith. Did you know that the probability of Earth being an accidental planet, hospitable for life, only using just a few of the most basic required parameters would be one in 150,000 million million. That's basically 1.5 to the power of 1,017. Now that's a ridiculous number of zeros. But naturalists express this extreme degree of faith in their humanistic religion. It's like trying to play basketball without the hoops, the lines, or even a floor. A good atheist needs to religiously believe evolution can 
outrun the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. Their confidence is in a closed system, and it has shut their mind to intellect far beyond the greatest imagination. Their choice is to censure great mercy and grace. But oh, thank God for his amazing grace that saves you and me, that draws you and me. So we will always pray that the spiritually blind will see. Non-believers seem to struggle with one particular blind spot of truth. They look at the circumstances on earth, recognizing the catastrophes, the evil. Then they reason, well, if God was real or loving or had an ounce of compassion, he'd just stop all this. He'd fix it all. Now, here's the problem with that ignorance of life. God made us all in his image, not the flesh, the dust part, but the spiritual part of us, the intellectual, emotional part of us. So if humanity doesn't have enough autonomy to either choose God or reject God, then how can we truly be made in his image and be like him? God's design of you is predicated on your power of choice to believe. No abuse or slavery can take that away from you. You are a believer of some sort. That's you. Even if it's your choice to not believe in God or the truth. In the Garden of Eden at our very beginning of human existence, we chose. We chose disobedience, betrayal, disbelief, treason, a lie, and put ourselves under the curse. Sure, God could have eliminated all the evil in that moment, but that would have eliminated all you precious atheists, nihilists, all of us from existence. Guys like C.S. Lewis would have never existed. God loves all of us. And yes, you non-believers too. The potential for life is worth the risk. And that's why God sent the ultimate antidote for our sin problem, Jesus, born of a virgin. Look, because as even Richard Dawkins would understand, a savior would have to have a unique genome makeup to reverse the law of thermodynamics as we call it, the law of sin and death. And then God raised his crucified son up from the grave. I've never met an atheist or a witch that can do that. I've never met a scientist who refuses to believe in God that can do that. Look, outside the box question just for you. Let me ask you this. If you knew beyond all doubt that you could have the most amazing life as long as you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, would you do it? Now, if you're a Christian, you're already nodding your head in agreement. Oh, yeah, yeah. But... I'm really addressing this question to the seeker, the skeptic, the critical thinking atheist. Would you receive and believe on Jesus if, if it meant truly living life the ultimate way it was designed? If your answer is yes, then you really are wanting the real meaning of life, the genuine truth. But if you said no, we might conclude that you're so in the grip of pride that you're not just truth illiterate, you're in love with your self-deception and you're willfully blind. Did you know that Jesus had to deal with deeply religious people just like that 2,000 years ago? If you believe in God, then you have to deal with the problem of sin. That becomes subconsciously painful for a lot of people because we tend to want to blame others and defer all the responsibility from ourselves. Oh, let's just get that away. Nobody wants to be to blame. Oh, pick me, pick me. <laughs> How many times have parents heard, hey, it's not my fault. He made me do it. She hit her face into my hand, mom, and now my hand hurts. <laughs> we want to sin and then blame the other guy. Society right now is all for this game. There's a new breed of social justice warriors ready to fight for the rights of the criminal because they're victims too. Defer responsibility because it seems so noble. I know that guy raped that girl, but bless his heart, he didn't have a dad growing up to take him fishing, so let's get him a gift basket and hire him the best of the best lawyers. We outlawed sin consequences because we decided in this new moral order that something hurting is bad. Is it though? How do you train for a marathon? By laying on the couch? Is life all about what's comfortable? I understand the motive to want to normalize broken, disturbed, and mental health issues. If we can lower the bar for the sake of being inclusive, it may express a shallow compassion to help to rescue. But you and I know that doesn't truly help the sick or the broken at all. It actually reinforces the confusion, 
the dysphoria. Legalizing crime does not help anyone. The victim gets victimized to the ultimate degree while the criminal is emboldened to worse depravity. To normalize sin is like normalizing drowning. If drowning isn't a tragedy, then we have no need for lifeguards, do we? Or teaching people water safety. Well, it's normal. Just let them drown. Don't put up danger, do not swim signs where dangerous undercurrents are, because what's the worst that could happen? I mean, they might drown. You see, someone could drown and that's just normal? That's just life? Is it? Well, of course not. And that's what we're doing today with this new religion of tolerance. We're normalizing brokenness and we're calling it a special identity. Now, we don't have to care or even try to solve the sickness because it's normal. See, you're special, so here's a bag of rocks as you drop to the bottom of the pool. Don't let go. You and I know that's just crazy talk. That's not life. That's not L-I-F-E. That's choosing death. Look at what you have right now. Do you know what you have? This is a relevant question in the context of talking about life. In great part because it was typically the question Jesus either asked or directed or implied when he was intersecting with an individual. That was his question when feeding the multitudes. He said, what do you guys have? What do we have? He didn't say, what don't we have? He said, what do we have? He kind of used that question on the woman at the well when he asked her for a drink of water. Again, Jesus used the same connection point with Peter when they first met. Jesus wanted to preach to a crowd by the Sea of Galilee in Luke chapter 5. So he gets in Peter's parked boat and he asks Peter, he says, would you push out a little bit from the shoreline? Well, Peter gives Jesus the use of his boat to present the gospel, the life-changing gospel. Afterwards, Jesus instructs Peter to go out into the deep and lower his nets for a haul. He wants Peter to get a reward. Peter obeys, even though the instruction, it seems strange and not the usual fishing technique. When Peter does what he's told, because as I said, life is really binary in your options. It's either yes or no. It's on or off. It's obey or disobey. It's life or death. When Peter obeys Jesus' instruction, he gets the full weight of Proverbs 22.4. A huge catch of fish with the nets beginning to break and the boats almost sinking. Peter is so overwhelmed with the miracle because it's truly Proverbs 22, 4. It's riches, honor, and life. He says to Jesus, here's what he says. He says, depart from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful, wicked man. You see, bad is very uncomfortable in the presence of ultimate good. The miracle shocks Peter into taking authority over his life by owning his failures and his sin. Had Peter ever been hurt or abused? Probably. Had he ever had someone in a position of leadership do him wrong, humiliate him, leave him stranded, disappoint him? Sure he had. Think of it. He was with Jesus, a leader of leaders with an extreme amount of authority that attracted a huge crowd down to the seaside. And yet, when Jesus told Peter to lower his nets, Peter didn't really trust Jesus or believe him. He lowered his old, partially rotten nets. Peter didn't trust leadership or authority. He had been hurt and he'd been taken advantage of so many times, he probably thought, you know, this guy's religious. He doesn't know jack squat about my life and how hard my life is. He won't know the difference between what's good and what's rotten. Prosperity, true life, will always put pressure on the rottenness in your life. That's why it's imperative to you for you to take responsibility today. Give Jesus the loan of your boat, so to speak. Let him heal you, direct you, fix you. But that won't happen unless you trust in him. Quit making life out to be multiple choices. Quit making life so complicated. What you tolerate, you can never change. So quit buying into tolerance like it's working on your side. It's not. Love is patient. It's not tolerant. Love is kind, not tolerant. Love doesn't keep track of wrongs, but that doesn't mean it's tolerant of the devil defecating on your carpet. True love has zero tolerance for true evil. That is life, my friend, and life is a choice. Oh, yes. It becomes an intricate symphony of choices summed up as a collection, your collection, what others may call your legacy. But as intricate and complicated as some philosophers want to make it, life has this binary aspect, two options, each step of life, right or wrong. 
zero or one, on or off, light or dark, truth or a lie, love or fear. And the greatest measurement of life is your ability to give out of that. You receive, you grow, and then you give. It's the fruit of your life. All of our lives produce fruit. Why is Peter's boat of any significance to you and me? Well, here it is. Peter offered Jesus what he had, a fishing boat to present the gospel. A little over 20 years ago, Pam and I, we got married. When we started out life together in Nashville, one of the things we did was loan our living room, our boat, to Jesus for promoting the good news. Just like this living room right here, we did like Peter and we said, go ahead, Lord, take our boat. When we started, it was so simple. We'd have somebody over for a coffee. We'd encourage them. With what we were hearing from God's word, sometimes it would be a couple needing hope or someone in crisis needing prayer for healing. We had unknown people, famous people, poor people, rich people, and they'd all ask, why does it feel so peaceful here in your living room? We'd have people over who were struggling and they'd end up telling us how happy they were to get God's hope for their future. Our living room, this living room, was kind of like Peter's boat. We let Jesus communicate whatever he wanted from our living room. James 1 verse 17 says this, Every good and perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of all light, in whom there can be no variation or shadow cast by his turning as in an eclipse. Whatever Pam and I have that is good is a gift from God. Peter might not have realized it, but the good he had was a benefit from God. We all get that same choice to either let Jesus use it or say no. Now, if Jesus uses your boat, something amazing is going to happen. If Jesus gets a cup of water from you, you can be assured something amazing is going to happen. If you let Jesus use your living room, something absolutely supernatural will take place because of your choice. There's an old East Indian legend about a king who was challenged to a game of chess by a visiting sage. The king asked, what is the prize if you win? The sage said, well, just some grains of rice, one on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, and so on, doubling on each square. The king was surprised by the modest request. Well, the sage won, wouldn't you know it? So how many grains of rice should the sage receive? Well, on the first square, he got one grain. On the second square, two grains for a total of three. And so on like this over and over. By the 30th square, it is tons of rice. In fact, a billion grains of rice is about 25 tons. That's what the sage gets. We tend to diminish the power of one right choice in life, one obedience for life. Every day is one square waiting for one more choice, one day with a choice for life. Then your identity thrives. Well, that's so little, Pastor Stephen. What if it weighed about 25 spiritual tons by the end of the month? As we loan our living room to Jesus, our boat, Great things happen. Guess what? Jesus cares way more for you than he does some denomination or religious building. Imagine that. Jesus caring so much about you. It's kind of exciting, isn't it? That Jesus would want to get a surplus of supply into your life, into your boat. Oh my. Some of you are thinking right now, I sure hope that's true. But it is true. Jesus wants to use, yes, he wants to use your boat. He wants to bless you your life. So let's get really simple, pragmatic, and apply these life identities. Think of what happened that day with Peter. Truth got in his boat. Light got in his boat. Love got into Peter's boat. That's why he was so overwhelmed with the outcome. He said to Jesus, depart from me because I'm a sinful man. He was saying, my identity doesn't line up with your power in my boat, and I know it. I own my failures. I can't blame my daddy and my family. I'm the loser here, and there's no hiding it, especially with your light this bright in my boat. Every good gift comes down from God. So what do we have? Can Jesus borrow it? Is it a one-bedroom apartment, a small house, your dorm room, one grain of rice? Jesus is in your boat. Can you pay attention for 30 whole minutes, an hour? Life does cost you something, my friend, but it's your attention. You do have to pay attention. 
God has a life download for you right now. And you don't need a conference to get it. You don't need another experience. You see, an experience won't cut it. Matthew 11, verse 15. He who has ears to hear, let him be listening and let him consider and perceive and comprehend by hearing. Good news costs you something, your attention. If you believe it, receive it. So wake up. Jesus is in your boat and you're about to get an overflow instruction. Wake up. Don't miss it. Prepare for the presence of God because it comes with the blessing. It will contradict who you were because God wants to transform you into who you really are. Don't be looking to defer blame and sabotage your authority. Life requires choices. Choose that grain of blessing every square. Choose truth over the multiple choice of lies. That means there are some forms of entertainment you can't play in your boat. Jesus is in your boat and there's a blessing agenda, not a confusion tolerance. You've got somebody in your boat getting you ready for the overflow and life actually is that simple. Yes or no, blessing or cursing, life or death, wise or foolish, right or wrong, don't buy the multiple choice lie or you'll be just another road sign warning those who come after you. Dare to believe in the great I am, the identity of truth, light, and love, for there is life in no other. Now it's time to be baptized by Jesus. Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit and fire. We started off this whole series called Life with some very special water baptisms. But it doesn't stop there. Don't stop there. It's only just begun. Life has movement and progression. Jesus discipled us for greater things. He baptizes us with Holy Spirit and fire. That's what Luke 3.16 promises. Why? Because when you choose God, your choice activates His power in your life. Life needs power to really work. A lot of power. So let's you and I pray this together and activate the four steps that we learned in part two and three. Remember, it's obey, praise, attend, imitate. Obey, praise, attend, imitate. Pray this after me. If you want to be filled with God's amazing power for life, pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, I want all you have for me. Say that. Baptize me in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Give me power to obey. There's number one. Power to praise you. There's number two. Call me forward to attend to you. There's number three. Help me to imitate you. Empower me to live life strong. You give me life more abundantly. I take hold of my true identity. In you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.